Oh, hey, uh, sorry it's taken so long for this video to come out. I've had some things on, but thank you all so much for getting us to 100 subscribers. That's really incredible. The support I've had on all these series so far has been amazing, so let's keep it on going. Um, I'm loving producing content for you to enjoy and watch and uh, get conversations going, and hopefully we can produce more, so let's keep it going. In 2009, Melbourne were the worst they've likely ever been. They had one win in the first 13 weeks, and they hit last place so hard they got special draft dispensation. It almost seemed like perfectly choreographed failure, and it almost was. Right as Jeremy Howe took screamer number 7, former D Brock McLean raised concerns with how the club was run, and the AFL began investigating. It turns out Dean Bailey and fellow mediocre coach Chris Connolly met in a secret room to discuss the merits of losing deliberately, which they eventually decided against. And I'm glad that they did. Imagine having lost matches deliberately, ruining the integrity of your sport just to draft Tom Scully, Jack Trengove and Jordan Gisberts. Yeesh. The club were fined half a mil for even having the discussion in the first place, and that was pretty rough for a team bouncing back from a $4.5 million debt half a decade earlier, with Bailey and Connolly receiving not insignificant suspensions. I mention that to contrast with this. In five years, the Demons had gone from league laughing stock to the precipice of greatness. Now, if you're a devout Gazman enthusiast, you'll remember this abomination of a video. It concluded that the Demons were the most inconsistent, volatile team in the league. They didn't do this steady rise to glory shit. It wasn't them, it never had been. They had to implode like they'd been doing for the last 50 years. And they'd been saving all their wild, flailing, aggressive volatility for one last implosion. It's a storm coming, Ari. We'd all best be ready when she does. It was staggering. Almost unprecedented. A work of art. And for fans, it was almost expected. Of course they crumbled. They'd wasted their only chance. Even when they were in with a slim shot at September action, they binned their last seven in a row to wipe themselves out completely. They'd beaten their old foes, but to quote Dennis Cometti, the cat was still on the back. Success against the hated enemy had come at a great price, and the Ds were again pointed at and laughed about. Damage control was activated, with Langdon, Jackson, Pickett and Rivers brought in to shore up holes and to invest in young stocks. Also, for some reason, all of them were either traded from Fremantle, born in Fremantle, or selected with picks traded from Fremantle. So, um, thanks, Justin? Um, actually, about that. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, Justin actually got his own back by ruining Melbourne's perfect season and sparking the catalyst for plunging it into a nosedive. So, fair to say he did end up getting his own back. Goodwin held on to his job as the league had been taught that even perennially underperforming coaches could suddenly achieve results if everything went right. And yes, I am saying that Adelaide's failure in 2017, itself partially caused by discontent at Lever leaving for Melbourne, led to a former Crow captain keeping his coaching role at the Demons. But as we've proved, Aussie sports are just that insular. So Taylor Walker must be playing the fucking long con with that move. They managed to rebound to 9th in 2020 under the partial guidance of high-performance expert Darren Burgess, who would fittingly later leave for the Crows, but it was a season of few talking points. The only one I could find is retrospective. Melbourne vs Port Adelaide, Round 9, 2020. In a nothing match that doesn't really bear revisiting, the Demons lost. Heavily. The game itself meant nothing. But combined with a decade of solid losing, it meant something. This red mass we've been watching fill the screen for the last 20 or so minutes represents how far the Demons were from a 50-50 win record from the moment of the Karayo exorcism. 
And despite their 2018 redemption, despite the fact their win totals had risen year on year for half a decade, the Blots of Red continue to grow into an ocean of failure, trending ever downward. Until this point. Round 9, 2020. The Demons sit 15, locked on three wins with four other teams. Only the dreadful Crows outfit have a worse record. The 323 people in attendance at the Gabba might not realise even to this day how privileged they were to see this side of the Melbourne Football Club as they fell for the first and only time since that fateful day in 2011 to 66 losses below sea level. The Demons would beat that Crows lineup by exactly the same margin that brought them to their nadir, and they would move to 12th. As of the production of this video, they have never fallen this low again, and they don't even look like coming close in the near future. And as for 2021, well, finals were the goal, but no one expected fireworks from the red and blue. There was one last piece of the puzzle that needed to be filled though. Wiedemann and Fritsch were serviceable forwards, but they needed an elite force up front. Enter Big Bad Benny Brown, the leading scorer in the league over the last three years. Somehow the D's got the somewhat out of shape spearhead on the cheap, with North deeming him to be surplus to requirements. So they must have had enough scoring power to get by without him. Oh. Oh, oh god. But remember, despite finals contention being almost a theoretical certainty, we were dealing with this team. So it blew everyone away when they went 9-0 to start 2021. They tore top teams apart. Melbourne fans had to wonder what the catch was to being able to enjoy such high-level performances. And they were about to find out. Watch out for the fans! Oh my god! Now, remember Adelaide, the team that had technically allowed Goodwin to do this? They'd finished dead last the year before. Except, they hadn't. They finished with one of the best final five game records in the league. They defeated Geelong in round one. They were playing at home, with fans desperate to get revenge over the traitorous snake Jake Lever. They were a team on the rise, not to be underestimated. No, no, I said not to be underestimated. Let's just... Oh, don't. Look, let's just... No, don't. Come on, you're making me look bad. The Demons cleaned up their act though, kicking away in the last quarter and pulling margin over the Crows. Adelaide would get a late consolation goal, but the Demons survived the scare to... Oh. Oh, the Crows scored again. Still, a narrow win was to be the wake-up call that... Hold on. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, God. Oh, God. You can't be serious. Jesus. I guess Tex Walker was playing the long con. The guy must be a complete genius. I can't lock. Burn for racism. But that sort of loss was Melbourne's 2021. Convincing wins over good teams, carefully building confidence in their fan base before shattering it with an awful performance against the very worst sides. Melbourne dropped points against just two top eight sides from ten matches, including beating Geelong. Against the bottom five though, they dropped points three times out of seven, almost a 50% rate and twice as often as they went down against elite teams. Geelong's own slip against Adelaide, though, was an outlier for their season, and indeed, their decade. Since 2011, they made it their business over the last decade to consolidate position, generating 14-17 to 17 win seasons with unerring consistency. They were a machine. They were reigning grand finalists. And they were keen to take revenge for those little demon upstarts for knocking them down in 2018. And take revenge they did. The D's had an hour of match time to turn this around. Melbourne, though, had more to take revenge for. The Demons were facing a team, a coach, a captain, who had brought their own team to their knees. And now, 
Riders Melbourne were about to secure their first trophy for 31 years. The Cats were doing it again. 19 minutes into the third, Ed Sheeran gold to restore a 44-point lead. And something just snapped. No. No, Melbourne decided. Not this time. This was what would end this saga. A trophy. A totem to repel the lingering effects from the Cario exorcism. So Kasaya Pickett immediately replied. Ben Brown brought the margin to 33 to end the quarter, and then Pickett again scores straight from a centre clearance. He opens the floodgates, and the ginger walks through, as does Charlie Spargo, who nails two in only seven minutes of play. A goal to Fritch narrows the margin to two, and then... nothing. Only two behinds cover the next 15 minutes of play. There was less scoring than me hitting up the town on a night out. There's 34 seconds left now. Geelong get a free kick on their half back line. It was a valiant fight back, but a futile one. Geelong will maintain their effortless professionalism to... Oh, what? The most drilled and consistent team of the decade does that and then gives a 50 meter penalty away to boot. Lever lofts one high to the hotspot, where Gorn, the fifth tallest man in AFL history, is one on one with... Gary Rohan? <laughs> um, okay. See how that one turns out. What a shock. Gorn goes back to complete his kick, and the siren sounds. I got something wrong in part one that's kinda relevant here. Maxi was only named vice-captain here. He didn't get the skipper's armband until 2020. So at this point, he wasn't the experienced, lion-hearted leader like his predecessor. This was only game 36 in charge. Could he handle the pressure after that little time in the job? The stats weren't on his side either. Although it's a complete soda of a shot, he's only 10 goals, 14 for the season, and 69-62 lifetime. Nice. And one could argue that this is the most important moment for Melbourne in the AFL era. It's not only the fact that this kick decides whether they get a favourable home final against the Lions, or an in-form port at a packed Adelaide Oval. It's not only the fact that this kick could bring Melbourne their first real silverware in Gorn's entire lifetime. It's not only the fact that this kick shapes a season that has been the only light of hope for his club in 20 years. It's the fact that this kick symbolises the completion of a full redemption arc for his team. From embarrassments to league champions, with both the nadir and the peak of his journey coming against the same enemy. And it's also that the man responsible for that is not only the captain, and not just someone who was an active part of Geelong's combined 300-point demolition of Melbourne on the day of the Karayo exorcism, he was a slow, bearded, injury-prone baldy who used to punch darts before training and lied to his former captain about it. He had begun his career as the antithesis of the ultra-professional, ultra-slick Geelong outfit. Now, he had the chance to be their judge and executioner. He takes a breath, he steadies himself, and all that's left to do is let history play out. This was huge. Far bigger than Max Gorn himself, and that's saying something because the man is large. For Melbourne to do this, 10 years after this, well, let's quickly check where every other club was 10 years after their worst defeat. Adelaide were in the most painful period of their existence, the Bears, Fitzroy and University were technically dead, the Lions won the wooden spoon, Carlton are still circling the drain, Collingwood got embarrassed on grand final day, haha <laughs> lol, Essendon were 14th, 
St Kilda were wasting a prime Tony Lockett. Fremantle will still be without a flag, calling it. Gold Coast are still without a finals appearance. GWS of mediocrity incarnate. Geelong were about to mail their coach to Adelaide again. Hawthorne and North Melbourne were the AFL equivalent of TV static. Port Adelaide choked harder than Mark Williams choked himself. Richmond... Um... Ah... Uh, <laughs> well, fuck. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Swans, uh, they were also no good. Yep, get back on the rhythm of things. Uh, the Eagles were about to launch into the Ken Judge era like a car launches into a concrete plinth. And the Bulldogs, oh, well, that's a pleasant surprise. But my point is, you'd have expected the Demons rebuild like all the other, well... Almost all the others <laughs> to have been over, to be away from the pointy end. But no, they were playing perhaps their greatest football that they'd played as a club, saving their best for the old enemy. Melbourne would win their match the next week. Geelong went to Adelaide Oval and lost, something Melbourne may well have done too. This served the triple bonus of making Port overconfident and complacent, making the Bulldogs fly to Adelaide instead of spending an extra week in WA, and forcing an elderly Geelong side to play an extra game while still missing their best player that season. So when a depleted Geelong returned to face their victorious foes, they simply laid down their weapons and begged for mercy. They wouldn't receive it. Energised and wanting to assert dominance, the Demons played, ironically, like a team possessed. The three remaining exorcists from Geelong had minimal impacts, and while Melbourne pulled up short of a three-figure belting, they did limit Geelong to scoring five points less than the Demons managed in 2011. The cocky power was slaughtered by the Bulldogs, which was a win for Melbourne. Instead of facing a strong midfield which hadn't set foot outside Adelaide for a month, They'd face a squad that travelled 9,000 kilometres in three weeks. Melbourne were as intimidating and as inevitable as the very being their mascot is modelled after. They were as big as the man who kicked their winning goal. But, as any Melbourne fan would tell you, it ain't over till it's over. Most on board the red and blue bandwagon had seen what happened last time they were on this stage. They'd lived through it. And they were more than ready to relive that disappointment again. But they weren't on that stage though. The comfy, familiar surroundings they'd called home since the very inception of the sport. They were about to fight thousands of kilometres from the east against the sons of the West. <laughs>